Well, now on to uh, three selections here that are uh, generally considered in the Imagist movement. Um, uh, Frost is really not associated with the Imagists so much. He didn't hang out with that crowd. Uh, Pound was the big, uh, the big sort of powerhouse. H.D. Hilda Doolittle and a couple of the other poets as well, um, and. Um, uh, you know, Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams. You can read my notes and see what I had to say about the Imagists and what they are. And you can obviously check some other sources on Imagist poets and such. Here I just want to kind of highlight a couple of three to look at. Uh, the Pound Poem's pretty short, isn't it? Uh, um, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bough. Uh, interesting. Um, uh, you know, the, the notes that I put down for you uh, talk about where this was, uh, where where we think it it's probably set. Um, Pound was living in Paris and associated with Gertrude Stein and so many others, even Hemingway and a lot of other folks at the time. All the expats after World War One. Pound was quite a flamboyant guy. Goodness gracious, um, uh, arrested in the United States. He was. Uh, associated with communism and just all kinds of radical um, uh, political things. And um, this particular poem, um, you know, a lot of people look at it and they'll make the connection and say, oh, it sounds like haiku. Well, yeah, sure, it does. Uh, Pound was uh, quite familiar with haiku. Don't know if he was in conscious imitation of it or not, but he's watching the faces on the metro train, uh, which is this kind of black, sleek train going through, and their faces are... Uh, uh, are are uh, are white um, uh, or light colored uh, for the most part because you're in France and um, and so he's looking through there and there's the contrast of the lighter colored faces with the dark engine one's natural the other one's man made the train is kind of an industrial um, machine and inside of it inside of it are um, are the individuals but he's got it kind of reversed petals on a wet black bow because you can see through the windows of the train you see that this is this is what a lot of people are are um, connecting the dots with with this particular poem um, the apparition of these faces in the crowd um, petals on a wet black bow um, a lot of people say a lot of people will turn it around and say no this has nothing to do with the, with the, the actual train um, it's just in the crowd um, and I've heard people argue that as well you can you can take it for what you will the idea here though is to have a very powerful vivid image that sticks with you and makes you think it makes you think about all kinds of things it makes you think about you know individuals versus the crowd individuals human beings within a, a metro train or metro train station or something like that um geez the, uh, the the banality of urban life versus the potential beauty of each individual petal or person um and so on it it it, it is a powerful it is a powerful piece even though it's teeny tiny and short it has been parodied a lot as you can imagine as all of these have been um when the ibn just came out they were sort of scoffed and laughed at a little bit. Um, but that's true with just about any movement. Um, William Carlos Williams, The Red Wheelbarrow, has probably been parodied more than anything else, okay? So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. You know, the chickens, the glazed with rain and, and white chickens and such. Um, you know, I have heard a couple of different takes on the poem. And, um, you know, among the, say, three or four million different takes on the poem. Um, one is um, that, you know, what he's trying to do is to, to show a stark contrast between red and white, and it's very heavy and rich in symbolism. I don't think I buy that so much. I think what he's trying to do is just to, is just to present us with this sort of flash image that's stark. He only reveals one thing about the image early in the poem, and then something added for contrast, the white chickens, later in the poem, okay? Um, and he builds the detail from the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rain, white chickens, okay? So it's a kind of progressive thing where you get a little bit more information each one. But nevertheless, he's trying to leave you with the same sort of thing that Pound is doing, which is a very powerful, strong, evocative uh, image for you to sort of make the associations that you want to, and 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 I think uh, uh, you know a painting is a good is a good comparison, right? Um, so that's one of the things they're trying to do. I mean, imagist poets are creating images, right? So like a painter painting a, a you know a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain with white chickens, uh, you know, make of it what you will. It can be a beautiful thing. It can be a wonderful thing. The interesting part about it 
is the opening line or the opening words so much depends upon, right? Okay, that's the controversial aspect. But what the heck depends on a red wheelbarrow with some, you know, uh, that's covered in rainwater with some white chickens hanging around it? Um, that leads it to a lot of that that leads to a lot of parody and satire. You know, so much depends upon, you know, a um, a Snickers bar left upon a chair, uh, blah blah blah, or a table, or so much depends upon, you know, a glass of of uh, Chardonnay, etc. So a lot of people can have a lot of fun with these kinds of poems, as you can imagine. But nevertheless, um, and I've even seen I've even seen one critic say, "Oh no, no, it's designed to be pretentious because the voice shouldn't be considered that of the poet. The voice should be considered that of a person who's an art critic going through an art gallery, looking at a painting of a red wheelbarrow with glazed with rain water uh, and white chickens, who's so full of herself or himself that that they say something like this, and our only response can be sort of a dumbfounded silence where they, you know, this pseudo profundity, ah, oh, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if I buy that. That's stretching a little too far. But it is easy to imagine that it could be something that was said by someone wandering through, you know, the Kimball or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, stopping in front of a painting and then turning towards one of us and pretentiously saying something like that as though they were going to impress us with the with their depth of understanding of art, I don't think so. I think he really is just trying to offer an image to us. But the, the the key line there is so much depends on. And in the discussion, I'll ask you, what do you think it depend? What what do you think depends on it? Okay. Um, now, the Emperor of Ice Cream is a really strange poem in some respects. And for many years, I, I I thought, what in the heck does this mean? What is this all about? But if you break it down and you really are patient with it, you'll see that that if you if you if you if you look at the two different stanzas carefully. Um, you'll see that it does have something to do, the, the two stanzas have something to do with one another. It's not just garbage and jo gobbledygook. A few things that you can piece together, like my notes said. Someone has died. It's a she. Um, if you know anything about Stephen's life, you know that he lived in Key West, and you know that in Key West there were, at the time, and still are today, um, lots of Cuban immigrants living there, a lot of African-American folks living there, a lot of Caucasian folks living there. It's a very multicultural place. Um, Somehow or another, the voice in this poem is dealing with kind of, I don't know, I don't know if I would say barking out orders, but um, making arrangements in a very authoritative tone um, a, to deal with the funeral wake, you know, grieving process for some lady who has died. The first stanza takes place um, in the kitchen. The second stanza takes place in the bedroom. Um, and don't call me a sexist if I say that at least back in the day, those were the two dominant areas of the home when a, where a woman was, you know, to be found um, in, in her domestic roles, right? The kitchen and the bedroom. Uh, hopefully we don't think so anymore. But at the time, 100 years ago, um, it's natural you would have these kinds of associations. But this is an old lady who obviously has lived her life uh, uh, in, 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 with, with a lot of time in both of those places. It's the two most used rooms in the house anyway, no matter what, the kitchen, the bedroom. Uh, call the roller of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups, concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they were used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in their last, in last month's newspapers. Let B be fina finale of seam, right? Let B be finale of of seam. Uh, that's an interesting line. I wonder what you think that means. I'd like to find out what you think it means. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Take from, and, and by the way, that you saw in my notes that, that it was kind of a tradition to serve ice cream at wakes and whatnot. Um, you know, people think that, oh, it's disrespectful or it's not a party, etc. Oh, a lot of people. If you've been to a funeral, uh, somebody who's lived a long time and, you know, passes away and the whole family comes together. There's a lot, in the South anyway, there's a lot of food, okay? And there's a lot of talk and a lot of visiting, a lot of neck hugging and a lot of laughing. And, you know, sometimes it's about the only time you see people is weddings and funerals. Uh, your second cousin and whatnot coming in from Minnesota or what have you. But in the South, um, funerals are, I wouldn't say they're big parties, but there's a whole lot of eating and a whole lot of talking and a whole lot of back slapping going on. Um, take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs, that sheet on which she embroidered fantails once, and spread it so as to cover her face. 
if her horny feet protrude, right? Think about an old person's feet and how, you know, the, thing, the, the toenails and stuff are kind of like claws of an owl or something, right? Horny feet protrude. They come to show how cold she is and dumb. Let the lamp affix its beam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Um, and it's a kind of a nonsensical line, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream, but it's also said with such a, a, a tone of finality, right? The only emperor, it sounds deeply philosophical, um, it, it sounds like the kind of deeply philosophical, profound statement about life's mean the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream and yet the absurdity of making a statement like that is what are you talking about number one what is the emperor of ice cream and you know it sounds like a silly silly thing to say um is in choosing to say a silly thing in a rather profound tone and with a profound sort of structure to it is stevens essentially saying that all of our solemnity, all of our profundity, all of what we have to say that's sort of, um, you know, uh, supposedly um, deep and evocative at a moment like this really doesn't mean anything because a lot of people just die and life goes on. It's interesting to try to connect some of these guys, Frost as well, mm. somewhat with the naturalists and their view of nature and the coldness of nature and the, and, and the you know, in the inevitability of death and and those sorts of things. It'd be interesting to make some connections there if any of you are interested, especially in your next reader response paper perhaps.